development. So TRL level, we are talking about two, three years, not four, five, or eight at all. There are no structures uh, out there that can be defined as multipurpose platforms. So first of all, what is a, why we need a multipurpose platform and what is in the first place? So if you look at the offshore environment nowadays, it starts to be a kind of crowded place. This is a slide from a European project showing you what, how many type and, and number of activities can take place in the offshore environment. From the classic ones, I mean the oil extraction, fisheries, the transport systems, down to the more recent one like renewable energy of different kind, wind wave, tidal. So is the best way to go out there and each one of us try to figure out how to solve very similar problems or maybe we can join forces and share some of the costs in terms of time, in terms of uh, money to solve these problems and maybe also share other things like can we have maintenance vessels for both of us, can we share the same platform, can we find synergies in a few words. The idea of a multipurpose platform is based on that. So multipurpose platform, if you want a definition, is a platform thought to serve the needs of more than one offshore industry. And that is because you, again, you start to have not any more isolated structures in the offshore environment. You start to have an ecosystem of industries. It's almost like a city where you have different players doing different things but can help each other. So some people even uh, are pushing this to maybe there is a revolution going on and we don't even notice it because we are starting to push the production of food to massive amounts in the offshore environment. So some of, some of the marine biologists, some of the scientists in the place uh, are starting to talk about a further industrial agricultural revolution. So passing from harvesting resources where they are and in an isolated matter to the systematic use of the offshore environment and the very true challenge is how can we do that in a sustainable manner because we don't want to repeat the mistake that we did on shore. If you look at the website of the Blue Growth by Europe, there is much more information about this. And it shows that there have been a huge interest in this area because for Europe, but for any country in the world, it's a wonderful opportunity to create more energy in a sustainable manner more food, but also jobs and economic growth. So there have been a number of projects, and this table tried to summarize those. Uh, so in the, you have name of projects, and then you have which kind of offshore industries try to uh, find synergies with. So the H2 Ocean project, that is the top left one, try to find synergies between aquaculture system, wind and wave, energy devices. Uh, some of them, like the Tropos, had a solution also on how to marry tourism with offshore renewable energy. Or if you talk about going back to what uh, Robert was saying, now they're planning for um, huge wind farms in the North Sea. Those wind farms are 100, 200 kilometers from the shore. So it's quite difficult to maintain them from the shore. So they're thinking about having offshore stations where you can have people, spare parts, and personnel that don't have to travel for 100 kilometers to reach the wind farm. So if you want this solution here uh, is basically a service hub in the middle of the sea that by using renewable energy is providing power to a facility that where you can find accommodations for people maintaining those wind farms but also spare parts and and also like it works like a port for best service vessels so they are starting to see the synergies they are starting to see we can help each other and this is my academic slide i suppose a bit more technical my my area why i am interested in this and what i'm doing in this area is mainly to understand 
They have studied how to model the dynamics of wave energy devices. They're still studying. They have studied how to model the dynamics of a floating wind turbine. So basically, what happens when I have this huge system floating? I have wind, wave, tides, currents. There is a mooring system dynamics. This platform is deformable. So how do you calculate all this and understand how does it move? So I can calculate the loads, and therefore I can design this structure. For multi-use platforms, especially those where you imagine to have more than one type of structure in the same platform, they are not such an established modeling approach. So these slides, apart from the details, show you that everyone is trying something different because, again, there's not been established what to do. So it's a nice area for research and for myself, in a way. I'm going to give you uh, a couple of examples of projects where I'm working in related to the blue grow economy. So one is the European project uh, Blue Growth Farm is a three year and a half project, 10 million euros will be spent, was misspent, who knows. <laughs> um, and the basic idea is there is a urgent need to produce more seafood. If you look at Scotland, Scotland is planning to double its production of salmon by 2030, I think, and all the near shore locations have taken. So they are finding, they are trying to find solution to expand uh, the suitable areas from near shore to far off shore to produce salmon. How do you do that? You cannot do that with current technology because all the cages, the uh, salmon farm barges, all the equipments are designed to sustain limited waves in uh, sheltered areas. So how do you do that? How do you place these things far offshore? Well, either you beef up those structures to sustain those bigger waves, or in a way, you try to create a safe environment for these structures. How do you create a safe environment? Here it starts the idea of synergies. What if you have an enclosed area where by having wave energy converters on the sides you absorb part of the energy coming from the waves in such a way that in this internal pool you have waves much smaller than the ones that you encounter outside. So it's a kind of safe haven where you can up to a point use those technologies used nowadays to produce fish but in an offshore environment. What if, in the process, you use the same platform also to accommodate a wind turbine to produce electricity and power up all the systems for this aquaculture system? So you start to see how each system helps each other. There is a huge platform that by itself, to build this platform only for salmon, it would be a bit of a shame and an expense, big expense. So you can use the same platform without any major modification to accommodate a wind turbine. But also you start to think about, okay, this is a platform in the middle of the sea. It would be interesting to monitor the local traffic for piracy or against piracy. It would be nice to monitor local environment conditions. So you start to say, okay, I can accommodate some weather monitoring system. I can accommodate some traffic monitoring system, and so on and so forth. So you can start to build a case where it, every industry tries to help each other in order to justify the massive cost of such a thing. So this particular project, what we learned from a previous European project is that the real business is selling fish. It's not selling electricity. It's much more lucrative to sell in salmon than selling the electricity coming from the winter park. So while in the previous project we had renewable energy devices and as a patchwork, a patch up, we put some aquaculture system uh, for around 2,000, 3,000 tons of fish annually produced. You can have oscillating water column systems, wave energy converter. These sites, this is a DTU 10 megawatt wind turbine. And the task that Stratlite was allocated in this big project was, okay, you are in charge of simulating the dynamics of a wind energy converter coupled with this platform coupled with the dynamics of a wind turbine. 
So the first question is how much is going to move? People from aquaculture don't want the cage to move up and down too much. They don't want to uh, because that can damage the, the cages. They don't want to have people repairing these nets and at the same time being shaken up and down. So what is the response to waves of such a structure? And internally we asked ourselves, if you look at Japan or other countries where they have developed very large floating structures, like floating airports or floating uh, natural gas uh, tanks, or even space for parking cars, when you have such a big structure, you cannot assume anymore that it's perfectly rigid, but you start to have long members. And whenever you have long members, you may have a elasticity playing a role in the dynamics. So we ask ourselves, can we still consider this huge platform as a rigid body when calculating these responses? Or we need to start to take into account the elasticity of the platform. Just for reference, all those structures that Robert showed before, platform, support platforms, so the SPAR and the SEMISAT, are modeled rigidly to calculate the responses, the global responses. So, just, um, okay. We did, I can talk about this more with you if you're interested and send you some references, but let's focus only on the last part. So, can we consider this rigid? So what we did is an hydroelastic analysis model. It's a relatively simple model. Again, someone can challenge us saying, have you validated your model? Well, how can I? There are no structures whatsoever out there, let alone experimental data. So the approach that we adopted was three different teams in the same project doing exactly the same simulation, but not talking to each other and then comparing the numerical results. This is basically the basis of the model. So it's an hydroelastic model where you have the three sides of this platform. And in, in the rear part, there are some openings in order to have the water uh, being able to flow because then you need an exchange of water for the fish. So basically, we had a simple beam elements hydroelastic model of the structure. And what we did was to calculate the first 10 modes of vibrations. And what we discovered were two things. And the bad thing is, look at the natural periods. Those are, as my students know by now, exactly in the middle of the bad, the, the, where the wave have the maximum energy. So Waves tend to have lots of energy between 5 and 25 seconds, typically. So that and a peak, the energy, the peak of the energy tends to be around 10 seconds. This structure, as was thought initially, has a natural period very close to that, so it's very bad, it needs to be changed. But the under, on the other side, the first six modes of vibration, so in here you can see um, pitch, roll, and if, that are the ones dominate, driven by the shape of the platform, or surges, way, and yo, those are related to mooring. These appear basically as rigid body motion. So you can still model your structure as a rigid body. It is a good thing because it accelerates a lot uh, the numerical simulations. About the flexible modes, you can see here the first four flexible modes that are the basically the 7, 8, 9, and 10. And they tend to have frequencies that are not excited by first order wave loads. So again, good news, we can, in order to have the global response of my structure due to first order wave loads, I can ignore the fact that it's flexible, the platform. I keep flexible in the wind turbine and the blaze of the wind turbine. But bad news is that I need to change that. So, what I was saying before is basically this. 
we have heat, pitch, and low natural frequencies in the dangerous range of periods, and that's not good. So what we did was a prime principle analysis, and this is also for my students. They think about this being just an academic exercise when we learn about the analytical formula to calculate natural periods, at that mass, because eventually you go in a company and you launch a nice CFT simulation or a nice potential code and they will do everything. I don't need to care about this formula. Well, actually, the understanding comes from this formula. It doesn't come from the CFT code or numerical simulation. So what we did, again, I tried to accelerate, is to do a prime principle analysis. And we basically proved that if you keep a square section for the pontoons, so initially, obviously, they were structural engineers. They say, let's take the best efficiency shape from a structural point of view. That's it's a square section. It's symmetric. When you load it, it responds symmetrically nicely. It's, you can exploit the second moment of inertia of the area, so it's quite nice. But from an hydrodynamic point of view, we've basically proven that even with a 2D analysis, no matter how much you vary your width or your draft, with some consideration, again, 2D, it, you cannot reach feasible natural period in heave, so you can never are able to push the natural period beyond 25 seconds. So basically, we proposed a new uh, section. This is nothing new. That is what semisub does. Semisubs try to keep the water plane area small and to have the buoyancy that they need from pontoons down below the water column so that you can exploit the fact that the wave loads decays exponentially and not much happens at that depth. And at the same time, where you have the maximum wave forces, that is the water plane, water line area, your water plane is relatively small. And you can achieve with this shape, varying parametrically the various dimension, you can achieve the above 25 seconds target. Now, obviously, I have the structural guys that are swearing at me because this is not simple to uh, realize money from a manufacturing point of view and it complicates their calculation a bit but is necessary so the conclusion from this project again there is much more to be said is at the moment the flexible modes are not excited by first order wave load so we can keep the structure as rigid and a simple modeling understanding of the physics underpinning the problem is still fundamental so you're not wasting your time doing the modules here and talking with the students. If you want to know more, we're going to publish four papers uh, about this project uh, at OMI 2019 in June. So more than happy after June, if you contact me to share copies of this. The second project I want to talk about is funded entirely by, uh, well, not entirely, it's funded by UK government through EPCRC and by the Chinese government, um, NSFC. And it's basically a UK-China project on the same lines, so with a twist. Rather than having these large uh, multi-use platforms for massive production of fish and energy, they are more interested in this particular instance, small communities. So what can we do for small communities and from a European point of view, it's difficult. We're not used to thinking along those lines, but from a East Asia point of view, it's a much more present uh, problem. They have a population that can be sparse, and there are some communities that don't have access to the national grid of electricity or the national grid of fresh water and so on and so forth. And they told me, my colleagues in China, that literally huge Highlands are being abandoned on the east coast of China because they cannot have this basic utility. They don't have access. So they either relocate people to bigger islands and they establish a national grid there, or they even start to sell islands. If you're a rich dude, you can buy a highland off the coast of China if you want. 
So for them to have a local source of energy, food, jobs, and revive hugely uh, the economic growth of these areas. So that's the theme and of universities. The other twist of this, the other peculiar characteristic of this project is that we don't have only engineers, we have social scientists, we have marine biologists. So we are looking at this from a multidisciplinary point of view. Engineering, yes, but also what is the socioeconomic context, what is the environmental impact. So we have Stratclyde, both Naomi and Tripoli that looks at the two engineering electromagnetics, drivetrain, and now architecture. We have Scottish Association for Mine Science looking at the environmental impact, and the, we have Cranfield University looking at the socioeconomics, and there is a mirror image of that in China, oh engineering God, by Harbin so Engineering University, oh social economic so by the National Ocean Technology, Technology Center, and environmental impact by the Asian Ocean University. So the basic idea, but I already talked about this, is when you put together different industries, you can do two, you can have two results. Either they like each other for some extent, for some aspects, there is a synergy there, or they don't like each other for other aspects and there is a tension there. So the whole purpose of this project is apply to small communities, identify, identify the synergies and try to maximize them, and they identify in an early phase of the design the tensions and try to manage them, eliminate them by design or manage them somehow. It's a multidisciplinary challenge and that's, I suppose, the very challenging aspect of the project. And not so much the, the technical engineering aspect is how to have all these people talk with each other and how to figure out what are the cross-disciplinary interactions. So that's why we have cross-disciplinary work packages. The very first step that we did, that again, uh, we submitted this to a journal, but we had a comprehensive literature review on multi-use platform from a socioeconomic, engineering, and environmental point of view. And we are looking at two case studies for small communities. One is the Chinese one that is, okay, Small communities in Chinese terms is not 100 people, it can be thousands of people. So how can we provide food, energy, jobs, economic growth to these islands with a few thousands of people, with a local, uh, so this is connected to the grid. In Scotland, is how to make green a uh, salmon farm. So rather than using diesel generators, we are going to substitute the diesel generator with small wind turbines and uh, storage, electric storage systems such that they can get rid of the use of fossil fuels. And beyond that, we are thinking about using wave energy arrays to create uh, more uh, convenient conditions, smaller waves in a particular area where you can, so pushing further offshore the salmon farms. The two concepts are complementary in many ways. So uh, one is much lower TRL level. The other one is, is more ambition. The other one is more nearer uh, to completion, let's say higher TRL level. One is connected to the grid, the other is not. Timeline, the, a more ambitious one is we're looking at the prototype in five, 10 years, while the other one's two, five years is feasible. And also from a power point of view, they're complementary. But again, I want to stress the fact that the, the multidisciplinary aspect is really the key and the challenging aspect. Talking with different people about this project, if you talk to politicians, they say, well, it would be quite nice if I can brand myself as the politician that has made green the salmon industry in, in Scotland. I would receive many votes, so that's a good thing. Uh, talking with the, like, the likes of Waitrose, Sainsbury's, uh, etc., etc. They actually already have a niche market for expensive salmon that has been grown organically or using um, green energy. So people, there is a niche, niche of people that are willing to pay a bit more about this. Then you start to talk about the people working on the feed batch. They don't want a rotating thing on top of their heads. 
they don't want the wind turbine to incline the barge where they work. So how do you manage them? Engineers usually, my experience, are the ones that don't make problems. They try to solve problems. So it's not a big challenge there. Lawyers, well, they make problems out of them. <laughs> they say, oh, it's a wonderful system. You have convinced all the others, but I do not have a legal framework to approve such a monster. I know how to approve a salmon farm. I know how to approve a small wind turbine. Put them together, I don't want any responsibility. What are you going to do? And a funny one that is not so funny, the marine biologist approached us and said, well, you have designed the perfect mouse trap for birds. Because on one side, you have trapped birds with those salmons, high concentration of salmons. And the other side, you chop the birds with a wind turbine. <laughs> and to be honest with you, the funny thing is that when we put, we developed a framework to systematically identify synergies. And by the model that was put mainly by me together, an engineer, the fact that the wind turbine chops birds and they don't eat fish was identified as a synergy between the two systems. <laughs> but that's why we need marine biologists in these projects. Again, I'm going to skip this, but there is not much literature about a comprehensive pastel approach taking into account all the points of view when you develop these things. And again, if you want to know more, there are a couple of papers in my about this. Thank you very much. And I realized that I took a lot of time. <laughs>